Welcome back everyone to the last session of the day and the last session of the Spatial Data Science Symposium. Uh, my name is Shirley Stephen and I will be introducing the um, members who will be leading uh, the last uh, session, which is titled Leveraging Nova Graph for Geospatial Data Acquisition. We have here Thomas Tillen from UCSB, Meilin Shi from the University of Vienna, and Jinin Gu from Arizona State University, who will be leading us through this session. Thomas, mm -hmm. the stage is all yours. All right. I'm going to share a uh, slide here. All right, so uh, on our agenda today, we have a few items. Uh, this is all concerned with getting data out of Nowhere Graph. And so we have kind of four key points that we're going to talk about. Um, we're going to introduce key areas of the Nowhere Graph schema. And while we do this, we're going to cover a few common query patterns uh, that we can use uh, across the entire database. Uh, these will come in handy for getting uh, temporal data, geometries, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, once that's done, uh, Janine's going to give a demonstration of our web search interface. And this is a nice abstraction over kind of these more detailed Sparkle queries where you don't need to understand the schema so much. And it's a good way to browse the, the data and uh, see what's relevant in there to you. And then last, uh, Maylene is going to uh, showcase a disaster relief map. And this is a Python application that's built on top of Nowhere Graph. And it's going to use data and concepts that uh, we cover in these previous three topics. So starting out with Nowhere Graph, um, Nowhere Graph synthesizes over 20 data sets and it represents all of this data in a graph. It has a quote, consistent data model. And what I mean by consistent is even though we have uh, a wide variety of data here, droughts, smoke plumes, earthquakes, you can query particular aspects of each of these uh, using the same um, patterns and methods. So in that sense, it's, it's really nice and uh, easy to use. And then there's also some open source tooling. For example, the, the web application that you'll see um, in the next next section, and there's also plugins for QGIS and ArcGIS. So digging into the actual data inside Nowhere Graph, uh, there's, a, there's a few fe key, uh, features that we want to talk about. And first and foremost, the data conforms to a formal ontology. We generally refer to this as the Nowhere Graph schema. And this ontology makes use of a few open standard ontologies. Uh, first and foremost, uh, it makes use of owl time, and this is for describing the temporal aspects of data. Uh, for example, if you want to know about when particular events happened, you would use owl time to, to find that information. It also uses GeoSparkle to represent geometries, and this can be geometries of natural disasters and places like hospitals. And another is SOSA. This is for describing observational data. You can think of this as uh, categorical data or numerical data. Uh, these could be things like how many acres a particular fire burned. And so understanding uh, just a few relevant pieces of each of these is crucial for writing effective queries. And last but not least, uh, this ontology and this data model uh, really enables scalable queries. And so what I mean by that, um, when we think scalability, we typically think of horizontal scaling and vertical scaling. On the right-hand side, we see all of these different data sets and we see the agencies that they came from. If we look at wildfires, we see that um, all of our wildfire data is coming from four different source agencies. If we're talking about vertical scaling here, this would be a Nowhere Graph expanding its data by ingesting more data from a particular agency, maybe an IFC 
uh, updates their data set with new data uh, that gets inserted into Knower Graph. And vertical scaling is uh, really common in, uh, in databases. Uh, but the horizontal scaling is, is what's really powerful here with Knower Graph. And what I mean by horizontal scaling is we can add a new source agency uh, for wildfires, for example, and your queries don't really need to change. Uh, all of this data, uh, going back to the previous slide, is you know quote consistent. You can ask for that data the same exact way. And so this is really nice if you're building applications on top of Nowhere Graph. You kind of write it once, and as Nowhere Graph expands, so does your application. And you don't have to go back and let's say rewrite queries or create new queries uh, to get at the new data sets. So starting with the geometry information, we're going to take a close look at GeoSparkle. And we're only looking at a particular subset of it. And so GeoSparkle is an open data model for describing geometries. It contains classes for things that geometries can belong to. In this case, we're just really focusing on the GeoSparkle feature class. And then GeoSparkle has relations that connect the geometries to features. So in this case, we see that a GeoSparkle feature connects to a geometry, which you can then ask for a serialization and well-known text. And GeoSparkle supports other serializations, but for the purpose of this, this presentation, we're just going to focus on well-known text. So Noah Graph's integration with GeoSparkle starts with how things like hazards, roads, and hospitals are represented. And these are all subclasses at the end of the day of, of GeoSparkle features. And so because of that, they can all be queried the same. On the right-hand side, we see an earthquake. Uh, again, this is a feature, so we can use the same verbiage to get its geometry. And we can use, again, the same verbiage to get the well-known text. And a tabular view of what a, a nowhere graph earthquake looks like is shown here. On line three, we see that uh, this, this object is, of course, a nowhere graph earthquake. But right below it, we also see that it's a GeoSparkle feature. And on line two, we see that GeoSparkle has geometry verb. And we see that it points to a new geometry node. And from just uh, looking at this geometry node on line two under object, you can see that it's a point geometry. This is the epicenter of the earthquake. Uh, here's an example of a NOAA flood. Again, we see that it is a GeoSparkle feature. Uh, the second type is, is different now. It's not an earthquake, it's a NOAA flood. This came from a completely different data set, but we see that we can obtain this geometry the same exact way as the earthquake. So what does this look like with Sparkle? Um, when writing Sparkle queries to get geometry data out of Nowhere Graph, there are really two main kind of key pieces of information that you need to keep in mind. Uh, first and foremost, uh, you need to have some sort of Nowhere Graph class that, that you're interested in. Uh, taking a look at our query on the right-hand side under our, the select statement, we can see that we're selecting fires that are coming out of the MTBS fire data set. And the second part is just reflecting on those um, diagrams in the previous slides of GeoSparkle. So underneath our MTBS fire uh, portion of the query, we get the fire name, and then we start invoking GeoSparkle. And we ask for the geometry node, and then we ask for uh, the geometry in terms of well-known text. Here's an example of, of what the results look like. Uh, these are just a few fires that, that came back. On the left-hand side, we see the node identifiers for each fire. In the center column, we see the name. And on the right, we see the well-known text representation. In this case, these are polygons. Uh, so these are uh, lists of GPS coordinates. And so if you plot these uh, in your favorite application, you can see the extent of the fire. Uh, so you can see, let's say, the burn scar. Now, looking at the name, we can see that these fires occurred from 2011 to 2017. And chances are, in most applications, we're going to, we're going to want to narrow our 
um, our queries to some particular point in time or some range in time. And to do that, we use the owl time ontology. And as mentioned, this ontology is concerned with the representation of temporal uh, information. And like GeoSparkle, it, it provides classes and relations between them. Uh, within Knower Graph, we're really just focused on a few classes and a few relations. And on the right-hand side, looking at this diagram, we can see that we have a base class, time temporal entity. We have an interval. An interval can have a beginning and it can have an end, which are both time instants, which you can then ask for uh, data in terms of year or a full date time or a time stamp. Uh, kind of simplifying this in terms of patterns within Knower Graph and patterns that, that you would follow within your queries, we kind of have these two, um, two cases. On the left-hand side, we just have a time temporal entity. And these are single events. And on the right, we have a time interval. So you can think of a hurricane. A hurricane doesn't uh, just exist at a single point in time. It's going to occur over an interval. And so this is how you would get at that information. Uh, you would say, get me the node that is the beginning, give me the node that's the end. Looking back at the previous slide, we can see that the time instant is a temporal entity. So we can therefore serialize it in terms of year or daytime. Turning these, uh, these two patterns into associated Sparkle queries, uh, on the left-hand side, uh, it's just showing how to query a time temporal entity. And again, uh, right under our select statement, we can see that we're uh, looking for fires out of the MTBS fire data set. We get its name. Then we ask for its temporal scope. And then we ask our time to give us that, uh, that temporal scope as a year. And then the very last line is filtering all of these fires so that we only get the ones that happened in 2018 and sooner. When querying a time interval, uh, there are a few more hops, uh, but it's not too bad. And so the first few lines look exactly like uh, what we have on the left-hand side. Um, in this case, we're looking at hurricanes instead of uh, wildfires. Uh, we get the hurricane name, we get its temporal scope, and then we ask for, uh, the node that represents the beginning of that event, followed by asking for the full date. And we do the same thing on the last two lines. We ask for when it ended, and we ask for the full date when it ended. And here's just a, a brief look at some of the results that happened. Uh, on the left, we see the names of all of these hurricanes, these typhoon events, and we have the beginning date, and we have the end date. And you can imagine how using the uh, filter query on this left-hand side, how you can ask for hazards that happen between uh, two dates. So narrowing results down by time, getting their geometries, all very important for, for most applications. Um, one you know, big piece of usability in Knower Graph is its spatial model and Knower Graph supports eight different types of places. These are shown below in this, uh, in this table. So you can ask for things that happen in zip code areas. You can ask for things that happen in judicial districts. Uh, or my favorite, the administrative regions. Um, you can break administrative regions down into a few levels. Level one are countries, level two are states, and level three are counties. There are a few more levels, four to six, which are sub-county. Uh, but for the scope of this presentation, um, we're just going to be looking at these three levels. So like GeoSparkle and OwlTime, Graph again, provides classes and relations. We can see some classes on the right-hand side that represent uh, those rows we saw in the last slide. So for example, uh, we can see a zip code area, the uh, federal judicial district, and on the left-hand side, we see some relations. We see a knower graph SF within relation. We can use these to track down hazards that happen within areas. 
So on the slide, we see a full spatial temporal search. This is combining elements of geosparkle, owl time, and the spatial aspects of the noograph ontology. And the goal of this is to search for all of the different hazards in that Norgraph has that happened in California after the year 2017. So we start out by looking for all of the administrative regions that are level two, and recall that these are states. Next, we filter all of these down to the ones that just have the name California. In the United States, there's just going to be one. Next, we look for all of the hazards in Nowhere Graph, and we filter those down by the only the ones that are within California. We get the names of those, we get their geometries. Again, this is just using that uh, GeoSparkle uh, query pattern that we had covered earlier. And then we go ahead and we use the owl time ontology to narrow this down and we filter uh, to only the ones that happened after 2017. Looking at the results here, uh, just a few of the results. Again, we see the hazards on the left side. We see their names and the year that they occurred. Uh, in, in this slide, I, I didn't include the well-known text representation. These polygons can contain you know, hundreds of points, and so it's a little hard to show in, in tabular view. But on this slide, uh, this is just using data from one of those rows. This is a, a visualization of the cat fat cow fire in Tulare, California. And just looking at this geometry alone, we can kind of play around and, and draw some conclusions like uh, it didn't burn into strawberry and fat cow meadow. And we can see that it was stopped along the southwestern ridge and that uh, it burned through this uh, narrow canyon on the, the southern side. And so just kind of to recap all of this, um, just stressing the importance of understanding uh, the structure of these external ontologies and their patterns and, and how essential that really is for obtaining data. Um, but also saying that even though we have so much data that, that's varied, um, just by understanding a few key aspects of these ontologies and recognizing how these query patterns can be used, uh, you can make some really powerful applications on top. And third, uh, Sparkle is the standard query language for NoahGraph's database, uh, which is on her text GraphDB. There's an open Sparkle endpoint, and you can find more information about uh, the ontology, these data sets, and a link to the Sparkle endpoint on NoahGraph's homepage. Uh, so that concludes the, uh, the little session on Nowhere Graph's internal data representation and how to use these standard query patterns to get at the data. I'm going to pass this off to Janine now, who's going to give an overview of the Knowledge Explorer. OK, thanks, Thomas. Uh, let me share my screen. Mm. Thanks, everyone. Uh, so uh, this here is the interface of our facilitated search. Uh, I will first give the brief intro overview of the facilitated search interface, and then I will show you some specific cases so that you can know how the interaction works. Uh, you can see here on the navigation bar, these options are about our uh, Nowell Graph project, including the introduction. Uh, introduction of the project, uh, like the data set that we are using, and Thomas also introduced in his presentation, and also tools that, oh, you cannot see the screen, right? Sorry, uh, let me check. Oh, sorry, uh, I need to share the Chrome. Let me share it again. Sorry for the interrupt. Can you see the screen now? Yeah, okay. Uh, so 
uh, on the navigation bar, these options are information about the project of the Noel graph, including the the data set they are, that we are using, the tools that uh, have been developed on top of the Noel graph, the team members' publications that uh, come out of the project, and uh, other detailed information about the Noel graph. Uh, so uh, the faceted search uh, interface is one of the tools that have been developed on top of the Noel graph, and it can help explore the Noel graph data set because the Noel graph project contains uh, around the 12 billion uh, data set with rich spatial and temporal information. And so this uh, faceted search interface enables users to uh, interactively and conveniently browsing and navigating the rich data set. Uh, in the middle of the homepage, when you click on the step-by-step -step example button. Uh, you can see more detailed uh, introduction about the project Noel Graph and also the faceted search interface. And uh, when you scroll it down, and you also can see that the users are provided with a very clear step-by-step -step guideline about how to use this interface. And uh, you can explore by the place. You can explore the functionalities by people and, and hazard. So it's really crystal clear and the users can, it's easy for users to get hands on. And uh, as was, I said, uh, the faceted search also enables more functionalities under uh, very complicated search conditions created by uh, the faceted search facet selection. Uh, so you can start to explore the different uh, types of data like uh, place, hazard, and experts. Uh, so uh, let's choose the place as an example. Uh, then we are redirected to a new web page. This new web page has three columns. Uh, the left one shows different types of facets so, so that users can customize their uh, queries uh, that they are interested in. And the, in the middle column, uh, it shows all the searching results in the table. And the right part also shows, visualize all the results uh, that shown on the first page, the current page in the table. And so uh, let me give some uh, searching cases to show how to use this uh, interface. Uh, let's say actually uh, we want to find all the places in the in Santa Barbara. So here we can type the name Santa Barbara, and then we can click on the search button. Of course, you also can just type enter on the keyboard. It will come out the, all the results. Yeah, we get uh, uh, the first 20 records in the table. Uh, these places are sh shown. And uh, every uh, table cell in this table actually is clickable. And uh, when we uh, click one atom, it guides us to the corresponding fossil link. We can see here, uh, we have the um, geometry of this uh, collector atom, the different uh, geosparkle uh, features, the corresponding FIPS, the quantified name, and also the corresponding um, spatial uh, relationship. Yeah, um, so we have searched all the places in Santa Barbara. And what if uh, you might also want to search specific places uh, in Santa Barbara? For example, uh, I want to know all the parks and the schools in Santa Barbara. Then we can just um, here in the facets panel, we, we provide different types of uh, places mm, like build up area, surface water, terrain. These are three super classes of uh, place features. Uh, when you click on the arrow, it unfolds all its corresponding subclasses. Then we can just uh, choose 
park park school and then we can get all the results here yeah we get all the uh corresponding results uh and the, on the first page it shows the fir the first 20 uh records and also we can click on this harder stadium and we can see the corresponding geo sparkle features the label of it and the corresponding uh feature id uh, the creation date yeah and uh, we also can um keep narrowing down the search by adding up the zip code like we want to find uh, all the parks and schools in the area with the zip code 93105. We also can notice that as we input the uh, digits of the zip code, it also gives us the hint of the zip code. And we can just uh, type enter and they give us, uh, shows us the uh, all the first 20 uh, parks and schools in the area of uh, nice 105. And we also can just uh, type on the atom and then we can also show the similar uh, features and uh, the attributes about this clicked atom. Yeah, here is the showcase uh, for place type. And now I will also want to uh, we, let's clean, clean this up. And we also want to check hazard information. We can just uh, click this tab. Then we see the, the first 20 records about this hazard. And, and you might also want to uh, look into a specific hazard, for example, the wildfire. And we can also find it here in this facet, uh, wildfire is under the super class of a fire. So we can click on the arrow, this item, and uh, maybe we can just uh, try this MTBS fire. And so when we check this checkbox, all the subclasses are also selected. And, uh, and all the, the first 20 records of uh, uh, wildfire are shown and we may also can just add the zip code for it. Let's see. Yeah, we got uh, the 21st uh, wildfires and that occurred in the zip code 93105. And uh, we can click one atom for the specific wildfire. We can show the ge corresponding geometry of this uh, wildfire, the geosparkle features. Uh, it belongs to the um, MTBS wildfire is also a spatial object, uh, the feature of interest. And we also can know the fire name, the temporal scope, and it's corresponding the spatial relation shape. <laughs> and uh, in this um, hazard table, uh, we can know that it gives us the name of the hazard and the type it belongs to, the occurrence place, and also the temporal duration, like a start, start date and end date. Yeah, uh, here uh, we also can just check this people type by clicking on it. And it also shows us the expert uh, with different kinds of expertise. And um, you also, users also can just uh, uh, click on the specific uh, uh, expert topics uh, and to get to search for the expert with the specific uh, expertise you can see here and the name the affiliate the affiliation that the expert belongs to the corresponding expert and the place we can also click on the name of the expert we can know uh, is uh, the 
the contribution of this expert. Yeah, yeah here are the uh, showcases that uh, for these three, uh, three different uh, types of data. Uh, except for these cases that I have presented, uh, actually, faceted search interface also can help address a wide variety of geographic tasks, from a search for local experts in humanitarian relief to natural disaster assessment and uh, management. And our interface is open source. Uh, you are more than welcome to raise an issue if you have any questions. Uh, so now I will transit to Meiling. She can present her work on the utilization of GeoSparkle queries on the end product. Meiling, you can share your screen. All right, so um, after we learned about uh, the data model and uh, querying patterns of the NOAA graph from Thomas and uh, the FASICIT search interface, uh, the Knowledge Explorer uh, that Jenny has just introduced, so we will now uh, present an actual uh, use case, a uh, disaster relief map uh, built upon uh, the data that we have uh, in the current knowledge graph. So uh, in this uh, use case, we will use uh, wildfire as one of the hazards that we have and uh, use Santa Barbara County as an example. And of course, uh, it can be uh, easily to extend it or uh, apply it to other regions, uh, counties uh, or uh, states uh, in the US. And uh, we would like to mention that uh, we have more than uh, 20 data sources in the graph. Uh, including uh, smoke plumes, uh, air quality, uh, soil profiles, so on and so forth. And uh, all of them uh, will, can be queried uh, with a similar pattern uh, that you can see uh, later in these queries. So uh, uh, back to the use case, uh, let's uh, now assume that uh, there is a wildfire uh, going on in Santa Barbara County. And for us, uh, we would like to show a relief map uh, to provide uh, information to uh, the decision makers, like uh, how do we get access to uh, local facilities, uh, hospitals, uh, airports, uh, or can uh, provide information like uh, what are the areas that uh, we would uh, like to avoid. Uh, for example, the past uh, or recent uh, burnout areas of the wildfire and lastly, uh, we can also uh, offer the information uh, like uh, where are the uh, staging areas, um, like schools um, or parks in the region that we can use uh, to allocate uh, resources. So I will show uh, all these uh, queries in detail now. The first one is uh, the wildfire query, which uh, Thomas also uh, uh, introduced uh, in his part. And now uh, here uh, we can see uh, that uh, how we select like uh, specific uh, features that uh, we're interested. Uh, for example, we want to know like the time of the fire when it happened, uh, the temporal scope. And uh, we want to know the name of the fire, uh, the location of the fire. So uh, this one here will be the node ID for uh, uh, Santa Barbara County. You may also uh, notice this part from uh, Ginny when she showed uh, the fuzzy links. And of course, uh, we would like to know uh, the geometry uh, because we want to later uh, plot them on, on the map. For a hospital query, uh, we also provide additional information uh, like uh, the number of available beds, so uh, beds counts, uh, other than that, we have uh, information for the road segments. So this one will be uh, uh, the highways uh, in the uh, United States uh, for airport information and uh, parks and schools. So you may notice that all these uh, queries are very similar to each other. 
uh, Thomas is also introduced about this. Uh, we have real consistent uh, pattern here. So we can see uh, we all want to know like uh, it is within Santa Barbara County, uh, the name of uh, the facility and uh, the geometries. So uh, this part will all be on uh, the data and a query. And uh, next we will move to move on to this uh, map visualization uh, step by step. Um, first, uh, we would like to show an uh, shape files for Santa Barbara County. And uh, for the map visualization, we are using uh, the Folium library, uh, which is a Python uh, wrapper for a, a leaflet. And uh, so here will be uh, Santa Barbara County. Uh, we can see like the boundary of it. And uh, next, uh, we will uh, convert all these uh, data that we retrieved uh, using the previous queries uh, from the, the nowhere graph uh, to convert them to geodata frames. And uh, we would like to make sure all these data frames are uh, in consistent uh, projection systems. So the CR CRS here, uh, the uh, coordinate reference system, and together with uh, these shape files so that they can be uh, static on each other. Next uh, will be uh, this part that we add all this uh, information that we have on the map. And here will be uh, the final relief map that we have. Uh, we'll also enable a, a layer options here and a couple options for a base map as well for uh, better visualization purposes. So uh, let's now uh, zoom into the Santa Barbara region uh, for some details. Let's see. Here. So uh, we can see that uh, the red lines here are uh, the highways. So this one will be the US 101. And uh, we can see that there are three uh, airports in the region. Two of these are uh, heliports. And for hospitals here, we have, I believe, four of them. And apparently, uh, the Santa Barbara College Hospital is the largest, with uh, more than uh, 400 uh, bed counts available here. And up in this uh, mountain ranges, uh, we can see all this past uh, burnout areas. So we have uh, here, moment, let me refresh it. Okay, now we come out. So here we can see uh, this one is the T fire from 2008, Kisusita uh, fire in 2009. Uh, this one is really close to the residential area, the paint fire from 1990, cave fire uh, from uh, 2019. This one is uh, a very recent one. And here we have the gap fire in uh, 2008. So uh, let's assume when, when a wildfire is going on and we would like to uh, select some of the area uh, as our staging areas for the parks and schools that we have. So I guess we may want to uh, like skip uh, these options uh, that falls within the previous burn area, especially uh, the recent ones because they might have a higher risk of being flooded. And I uh, know like uh, these fires that uh, they rarely go across the highways. So maybe uh, we can have like better options like below the you know, US 101 highway. And uh, I'm, I'm not 100% sure I am not a, a disaster uh, response expert. So uh, essentially we want to have uh, this uh, relief map uh, to provide all this uh, relevant uh, information for uh, the decision makers. 
And uh, yeah, in general, that will be how uh, the relief map uh, looks like. And uh, in the end, I would like to mention that uh, all uh, the data involved in this map, as well as uh, this uh, uh, Jupyter notebook, can be found on our GitHub page uh, here uh, that you can view it. So if you are interested in it, you can try it out yourself and uh, play around uh, with uh, these interactive uh, visualizations. Yeah, that will be my part, and then I will stop sharing. Thomas, you're muted. There we go. Um, so just some, some basic, you know, conclusions from uh, what, what we've gone over in this session. Uh, Nowhere Graph is pretty big. Uh, there are over 12 billion nodes in this data set, and it's all pre-synthesized data. Um, hundreds of hours of, of brain power has gone into thinking about how to combine all of these data sets together and doing QA and um, building the data pipelines to get this in the graph. Uh, the data model is is built and based off of community created standards, uh, GeoSparkle, all time, things like this. And there are more, more tools uh, like the Knowledge Explorer uh, for end users. And you've also seen how scalable applications can be built on top of this data product. Um, thinking back to Maylin's queries, all of those queries were thinking about areas within a, a particular uh, administrative region. And you can easily change that and, and make that map anywhere in the US uh, just by changing a few lines in your queries. And so that concludes uh, the main, main session and we'll leave this open for questions. And okay, so uh, we showed how temporal entities can be handled, but an event like a hurricane would also have a location that varies over time. How do we accommodate for that? Uh, so one thing that uh, we didn't go into depth about was the SOSA ontology. And uh, just really quickly, I'll get... Oh, um, you know, I actually can't present while the question is open. Um, so, uh, thinking about how to share or, well, um, view the tracklets of a hurricane, uh, this is the ontology documentation page and looking at hurricane tracks, that's uh, what we're interested in. Uh, I've pulled up a list of storm track observations for a particular hurricane. And each one of these is its own uh, GeoSparkle feature and storm tracklet that has its own associated geometry. And just to give an example of an application of this, here's a slide from another presentation where somebody went ahead and plotted out all of these storm tracks uh, across the, the south, southeastern United States. And so you can take take all of these and um, you know, plot them in order, let's say. And there's additional information uh, that, that we didn't talk about how to get. For example, these hurricanes all have uh, speed, uh, speed data. This is all related through the SOSA ontology right here. And the, the key piece that, that we're interested in are these observation collections. These collections have individual observations. And so that's kind of the gist of, of how that works. Um, surely might uh, be able to add more about the temporal aspects of, of that data. Uh, let's see. And this might also be a good uh, 
surely question as well, but uh, just real quick. Uh, so hazards are a, a, a big major piece of Nowhere Graph. Uh, there's been a, a work done with direct relief uh, related to this. And so that's just kind of one kind of self-contained uh, piece of it. But there's also information about human health. For example, we have information on diabetes rates or um, on, I think another is uh, a, a metric on mental health. There's also information about croplands. And so, and all of this data is in there right now. Um, and I'll refer back to that, that PowerPoint slide where we kind of listed all of those different data sets that are in. I'm not sure if Shirley wants to add, add any more to that. Yeah, I can add a little bit um, about it. Um, so uh, one of the primary purposes of our Nova Graph is uh, addressing several uh, domain needs. So we uh, work closely with um, people from domains such as humanitarian aid, food supply chains, and farm credit. And um, a lot of these domains uh, require hazard data sets to address uh, a lot of their questions. And so, yes, primarily we have a lot of hazards, but like Thomas mentioned, we do have a lot of other environmental uh, data sets as well, such as croplands, uh, soil types, uh, and uh, air quality information. And these are useful to add, uh, address some of the needs of, for example, folks in food supply chain, for example, uh, how does, uh, what are the crop types in a specific geographic area or how, for example, uh, smoke uh, from smoke from a hazard could affect, uh, for example, lettuce in uh, uh, lettuce crops in a specific geographic area. Okay, so uh, we are at the end of our session. Thank you so much, Thomas, Jinning, and Malin for giving a very wonderful presentation.